Greetings, everybody. I'm Larry Williams, the director of Karma, the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis at uh, the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. It's January 9th, and today it's my pleasure to welcome you to another version of a Karma Quick Chat. And today we'll be talking with Dr. Brent Goldfarb, who is the Dean's Professor of Entrepreneurship and the Academic Director of the Dingman Center at the Robert Smith School of Business, uh, School of Management at the University of Maryland. So uh, Brent, greetings, uh, glad to have you involved with Karma. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to talk with us a little bit in preparation of your webcast lecture that's coming up. That webcast lecture is in January the 20th, and uh, the lecture starts at noon Eastern time. It'll be, be available to all of Karma's institutional members. We have 170 universities worldwide that are members, as well as members of our 12 affiliate programs, including the Academy of Management. So uh, greetings, Brent. Hope you had a good holiday. So um, one, of the, yep, one of the things I'm uh, interested in as I talk with the different people who are involved with this is how they got started. So uh, how did you end up being an academic? Oh, that's a great question, Larry. Um, accidentally. So so there, there, there's a sequence of events and then... Um, I guess I knew I loved school and there's a feeling when you walk into a library and you smell the dusty old books that to me just feels soulful and a, a place to explore. And so academia, in my view, is the loophole in society where we get to explore questions that we're interested in and somebody like pays us to do this, which I, I am forever bewildered that that uh, of my fortune uh, in that. And so uh, why so for me it was why leave school of school such a great place to be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean there is a sequence of events that happen and all that, but that's a beer conversation, perhaps not not for a short a short thing like this. Well, I, I will look forward to, to having that conversation with you. Uh, the one thing that's also special about the people that uh, that uh, participate with us is although they are giving lectures on methodological talks, uh, everybody has their own substantive interest, and most people do substantive teaching. And so I was wondering, uh, what do you particularly like to teach? Do you have a favorite non-methods topic uh, that you get really excited about when you see it on the syllabus? And if so, uh, how did that come to be? Yeah. Yeah, so... Um... I do, and it's hard to choose. I'm going to give you two. That's great. Yeah, and and so the first is in my uh, entrepreneurship course, which I developed in in principle uh, with my uh, conspirator partner in crime, David Kirsch. Uh, is we 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 ask the students to create businesses for real. And they have to go create a product and sell. And, and what I find amazing about this is watching different students either be attracted or repelled by the experience. Because mm -hmm. for me, that gives them an opportunity to explore entrepreneurship in a safe environment and then figure out if that's something they want to do over time. And so I, I think that's my one. And then my two is uh, thinking about disruption. And, and the reason I find that really fascinating is I, I, I find common explanations of disruption not very thoughtful. And so bringing the students and walking the students through the logic of that I think is uh, fun and interesting and it ties on some of my research about bubbles and it, it's just a blast. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to uh, to give us a preview of your webcast lecture in just a minute. Um, but I noticed from your Vita that you also have a couple of other recent methodological papers. One has to do with a, a paper on testimony, and then the other has to do with bin scatter plots. And these, I want to make sure that our audience uh, is aware of what you're doing in that area. Can you like give us a quick summary of those two papers? What sure. The so the testimony paper is kind of, is going to be integral to my talk. And, okay. and it's a core thing, which I will reflect on uh, for a, in a minute. Uh, there, my, my paper on bin scatter plots is related, but perhaps a bit more tangentially. Uh, and I, and I want to give full credit to my, my uh, co-author there, Evan Starr. Uh, the, the idea there is that when, when we run regressions, we are assuming a particular functional form and uh, usually a linear form, sometimes a quadratic if we're uh, <clears throat> exploring that. And what a bin standard plot does is it allows us to interrogate that assumption. And so it's a semi-parametric approach. And what it does is it uh, basically maps out the relationship between an X and a Y. And you can do that and control for a variety of other, other things. There's some tricks to the trade and how to do that, which we uh, go over in our paper. Uh, and it, uh, it not only tells you what the shape kind of looks like, but it tells you how certain you can be about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you find out that yeah, you can fit a quadratic, but you really don't know if it's a quadratic because there's a huge amount of uncertainty and it can tell you which parts of the function you can be super certain about and which parts less because there's more information or observations. Um, so when we talk about graphing a functional form and graphing a function, uh, it uh, this is really the tool in which you can do that. Okay. And uh, you mentioned your other paper is kind of central to your webcast. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about your webcast. Again, that's coming up on January 20th at noon Eastern time. Uh, when is it January 20th at noon, Larry? Yes. Okay, I'll be sure to be there. Uh, the, the, yeah, so uh, a couple years ago, I got very frustrated together with my uh, co-author, Andrew King, and uh, about this problem of p-hacking and how that affects what we do in strategy, in particular, because I'm a strategy scholar. And we, we came up with the result that perhaps 40% of the results published in uh, top stra strategic man management journals are either um, false positives or, or larger than what we would expect in a repeat study. And so that's the reliability problem in a nutshell. We're not unique. This is something that we've seen across the sciences. And so there's no reason not to expect that. Uh, and then we started looking at solutions to this problem. And the common solution is like, oh, we'll just do pre-registration. And that's the common solution. This is uh, this is essentially the solution of the FDA with drug trials where the stakes are super high because we don't want to poison ourselves trying to cure ourselves. And then we thought about that in the context of strategy. And it turns out it's a kind of a very limited solution because to pre-register, you have to understand the data generating process before you collect the data. Mm -hmm. And that's hard enough in a field experiment, which I've tried and I've gotten it wrong. And I've like, I don't know anybody who's run a field experiment where it worked out the way they expected the first time. And uh, if you know someone like that, please introduce me to them. I wanna just kind of buy them a drink. And uh, so then the question is, what do we do? Because the second you violate strict pre-registration, the second the researcher has any degrees of freedom, in the data collection process, how to construct the measurements and what models to run. We can't trust the, the, the statistics that we see. So that means the p-values are too low, the standard errors are too low, the confidence intervals are too, are too small. 
relative to what would have happened had we been able to imagine enough and pre-register. So, uh, and, and this is the heart of that testimony paper, right? And the argument there is, oh, we're not testifying correctly to the papers, the, to, to our results, because we're claiming that the p-value is correct and it's not, right? And so the question then is, what do we do? And that's really the core part of my lecture. How do, how do we approach it? And the first is to understand that we are not doing hypothetical deduction, even if we write as if we are with all these hypotheses and present it. The second we iterate with our data, we're in the world of abduction, mm -hmm. or sometimes called inference to the best explanation. So it turns out that the philosophers of science, they've been doing something for the last 20, 30 years, and it's worthwhile for us to pay attention to what they're doing. Uh, and they've been developing these ideas around inference to the best explanation. And the, the presentation and the lecture is going to be about how to present work that's consistent with the epistemology uh, that we're using which is inference to the best explanation. I can give you the top line now and then nobody has to show up. No, nah, we don't want to do that. I, oh, think, you've okay. got, I think you've got to, you've got just enough there to win everybody's appetite. So uh, that'll be good. And so again, this is Brent Goldfarb, his webcast lecture, um, January 20th, noon Eastern time, available to Karma Institutional members and uh, all Academy of Management members. And you can find information about uh, all of our programs on the Karma website. You can get the abstract for Brent's presentation and access information as well. We also have a couple of other events on that Friday, January 20th. We call them topic interest groups. They're uh, also known as our Ask the Experts panel, and you'll find more information about those on the website as well. Brent, uh, thanks for sharing a few minutes with us today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to, too, forward to right. that too. Yep.